could I ask you uh, to do me a favour, and that is just to put your hands together again, because you know these two guys, these three guys, what a terrific job they have done for freedom in Australia. And it makes it very hard to follow Simon and to follow Chris. Um, so I hope that I can I can add to the debate. Um, as Henry VIII said to each of his wives, I promise not to keep you long, so I'll keep it as, as short as I possibly can. But I want to do just a couple of things tonight, and that is talk about what I think has changed, what changed on September 7, what we hope will change going forward, and what each of us can do to make sure that that change does happen. It was Ronald Reagan who described a government as being uh, akin to a baby, basically an alimentary canal with a ferocious appetite at one end and no responsibility for what happens at the other end. <laughs> and in Canberra for the last six years we've had one big messy baby. So I think one of, the, one of the important changes for me at least was when Tony Abbott signalled the return of an adult government. I'm sure he had Ronald Reagan's quote in mind when he used that word. But more importantly than just having a competent adult government in charge it is Tony Abbott's vision for Australia. Now, I'm not here to, you know, to, to, to spruik for Tony Abbott, but it's refreshing to hear the leader of a political party talk about the need for smaller government. It's refreshing to hear a leader talk about the need for more individual responsibility. So let me read one of the quotes that I heard from Tony Abbott's campaign launch when he said that his vision for Australia is not that big brother government knows best, it's that our country will flourish best when all our citizens individually and collectively have the best chance to be their best selves. He said it's rarely government's job to tell people what to do. Mostly it's to make it easier for people to make their own decisions. That was an important change, I think, on September 7. But it really is up to us, as John and, and Chris and Simon have said, to, to keep the government accountable. Saying, one, saying something is one thing as we know, doing it is an entirely different matter. That falls on, on our shoulders, I think. Let me talk about another change which you may not have noticed. Um, after the September, sorry, after the 2007 election, a number of left-wing commentators came out and said that it was time for a purge. That certain conservative commentators really had no place in the current national conversation, given that there was now a left-wing government in place. Well, after the 2013 election, do you recall Miranda Devine or Andrew Bolt or me or Rowan Dean or anyone suggesting that it was time for a purge of lefties? <laughs> it's tempting. <laughs> no, we don't go in for that kind of a liberal nonsense. We understand the importance of debate. I say to these lefties, do your, you know, do your best, go your hardest. Um, generally they tend to lose debates, but you know, do your best. It's called the friction of freedom. Again, another gem from Ronald Reagan. I think that, um, as I said, on this side of, of, of politics, we welcome debate. We understand that the gem sitting at the core of Western civilization is that contest of ideas. And it's only with that contest of ideas that you rid a society of the dumb ideas and allow the best ideas to triumph. And without free speech, that piece of intellectual machinery <laughs> stops to work, comes to a grinding halt. I believe that a change of government can bring about a great deal of change if it's the right government and the right change. I think we saw that under, under Howard. For all of the nonsense about there being a silencing of dissent during the Howard years, I believe that we had not, we in fact had an incredibly robust debate ar around a number of important issues. It was through robust debate that we had a better conversation, for example, about multiculturalism. We, we, we talk not just about the rights of being a citizen, but the responsibilities of being a citizen. It was because of a robust debate around education that we started to talk more seriously about issues of accountability and transparency and a decent curriculum and going at, back to basics. It was only because of a robust debate on Indigenous affairs that we've dragged the Labor Party to the centre on these issues too. So free speech is not some academic pursuit. It is a healthy contest of ideas, affects the way we live every single day. But the Labor government, as we know, in 2007 signalled a very different change. We had, as you've heard from Simon and Chris, um, two ministers who had complete contempt for free speech. And it was done unbelievably under the guise of human rights. Nicola Roxon's Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination Bill was a draconian attempt to stop us expressing political opinions in the workplace. And as, as Simon mentioned, Stephen Conroy's 
bill was unbelievably to try to muzzle the media in this country. Well, let me say right now, I'm a very proud member of the hate media in Australia. I think we've done a terrific job. <laughs> But more importantly than the media, the fact that those two, two attempts to muzzle free speech in this country were defeated, and they were defeated by people like you. They were defeated because people were upset, outraged by what this government, what the, the previous government was trying to do. So it tells you that we can never take freedom for granted. It tells you how fragile freedom is. Well, here's another change. And again, I'm not here to spruik George Brandis, but it's really refreshing to have an Attorney General in contrast to Nicola Roxon, we have George Brandis, who actually believes in free speech. But more than just believing in free speech, he, he wants to defend free speech. And he has a brilliant ability to articulate the arguments to, um, in defending free speech. And that is, that is very important. Um, George, I think the other important thing is to have an Attorney General that understands the history. Now, you've, you've heard a lot of the history from Chris. Uh, George understands the history of how it was that we came to a position where an elected government in Australia thought that they could get away with limiting our freedoms in the way that they did. You know, how is it that, that the ideals of the Enlightenment had, had, had just been swept away? Well, I think it's great to have an Attorney General that understands that the blame for what or where we were and why that happened lay not just on the left, but it lay on the right too. So again, let me just reiterate, I'm not here to be George Brandis' spokeswoman, but um, you know, to understand that, for example, the left once used the language of liberty in terms of classical libertarian notions of, of human rights. It understood that you know, that was how you fought for women's liberation, that was how you fought for gay liberation. They, the left once understood that censorship was an illiberal travesty. And yet 30 or 40 years later, 30 or 40 years ago, something dramatic changed. And it changed because the very definition of human rights changed. And it changed because academics such as Ronald Dworkin defined the most important right, human right, as being the right to equal concern and respect. Now you think about that, the equal concern and respect. What kind of human right is that? But that's what started the growth of the Human Rights Commissions, it's what started the anti-discrimination legislation, because feelings became the lingua franca of human rights, of the human rights debate. It recalibrated the whole movement of human rights towards victimhood. Human, as I said, human rights legislation grew. Um, the right not to be offended started to trump the right, not, uh, the right to free speech. In fact, free speech became the obstacle to the left's notion of human rights as egalitarian rights. And as you've heard, the full meaning of that, of that development, and that's a fundamental development that's happened, um, crystallised in September 2011 when the Federal Court found that um, Andrew Bolt guilty of breaching Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act for expressing a political opinion. That travesty led George Brandis during Senate estimates hearings in February this year to ask of the Australian Human Rights Commission, well, what in fact have you been doing to defend human rights in this country? Show me the programs. What arguments have you been making in the midst of that very heated debate over the Bolt decision? What have you been doing to defend human rights, the human right to free speech in Australia? And the answer from the boss of the Australian Human Rights Commission was telling. It goes to the nub of the problem. Gillian Grigg said, we actually have had an emphasis on the proper limitations of freedom of speech. <laughs> Don't get too cocky though, because Brandis is right. Some of the blame for the marginalisation of free speech as the most fundamental of human rights uh, must be worn by those on our side of politics, I think. Because I think we have let the left take over this debate. We let them redefine what human rights meant. We let them talk about it as part of their agenda. I think we dropped the ball on this issue. And Brandis has said, and I think this is another important change, he said that it's up to the Liberal Party to re-embrace this issue, that human rights arguments have to be made on our ter territory again. Well, I agree. Now, I know that Simon's talked a bit about getting rid of the Australian Human Rights Commission and, you know, three cheers for that. I don't think that's going to happen. So let me tell you what is going to happen and, and why even what's going to happen is an important change. 
Um, as Simon said, there are six commissioners at the Australian Human Rights Commission. And George Brandis' propose, current proposal is to introduce one freedom commissioner. Now, that's, that doesn't sound like a big change, but it can be because a lot of small changes will eventually recalibrate this debate. It take, it'll take a lot of small changes to turn back the tide on this debate. And we do need to push on with this. You know, we have to lead the way. And I think if we in Australia are one of the first countries to appoint a Freedom Commissioner, it might just catch on. Because I can tell you, in countries like Canada, the founders of the Human Rights Commission there are appalled at what their institutions have become and how illiberal they have become. Turning back the tide, and it's a powerful tide, think about it, it's, you know, it's driven by vested interests and fat bureaucracies that have grown rich on ignoring the most basic of human rights. It's not an easy ask, but to even install one Freedom Commissioner, if it's the right person, I think is an important step. And if we do have a Freedom Commissioner, this is what I think the role should be, I, I don't know what George has in mind, but this is what I think a Freedom Commissioner should do. When he or she sees the word racist or xenophobic being used to shut down debate, call it for what it is. When he or she sees a government using the word consensus or demanding bipartisanship on an issue to shut down genuine debate, and we saw that often with Kevin Rudd, call that for what it is too. If he or she sees political correctness settling in over a debate, stifling ideas and stopping us from thinking and speaking freely, call that out too as an unacceptable constriction on free speech in a Western democracy. If he or she sees feelings and the right not to be offended trumping the right to free speech, well, call that out too, because that would be a terrific change. Now, of course, this, as, as Simon said, could keep an entire bureaucracy of Freedom Commissioners busy. But the truth is, of course, that we can never leave it to a Freedom Commissioner. We can't even lead it, leave it to six Freedom Commissioners. It will take an army of unpaid, unofficial Freedom Commissioners to do this job. We need people to beat the drum. We need them on the battlefield, not on kitchen duties. We, and the responsibility is with each of us in this room. Each of us needs to ask what we can do on this front. Yes, of course we can support the IPA. We can, but let's do more. Let's go out and find another five friends who will support the IPA. Let's grow the membership of an organisation like the IPA. But let's do more again. You can't just leave it up to John Roskam and his tireless, dedicated team. Let's think, each of us, how we can keep pressure up on this new government to do what it's promised. Because, you know, we know what governments do. They do too much. They like to do stuff. And it happens on both sides of politics. As much as I love hearing uh, Tony Abbott's vision of a smaller government, I'll wait and see. <laughs> it's the inevitable consequence of power. We know that, the imperative to do something. And it often translates into doing the wrong thing. And it translates into growing the size and the power and the cost of government. And every time the government does something, it's funny how it ends up picking our pockets for money. <laughs> it often ends up chaining us with a new set of rules that invariably restrict our freedom rather than enhance our freedom. So let each of us remind this government that we don't want another hungry, messy baby in Canberra. We can write letters to newspapers, we can write to our MPs, we can engage in debates, we can learn from the union movement on this. Don't go around expecting changes, for example, in workplace laws unless you're willing to actually be part of this debate. The union movement did a remarkable job in 2007, whatever else you may think, of leading the debate on that front. In fact, they launched such an incredibly successful campaign against work choices that I think it was, you know, has potentially retarded reform in this country for many years to come, and I think that's a very sad thing. But it's up to us, it's up to big business. You know, big business is often out there demanding that government do this and that, but you don't often see big business leading the debate on this front. Well, get out there and lead, don't follow. Um, and if you think the ABC is too biased, don't sit on your couch muttering about how it's not, you know, following the obligations under its charter. <laughs> write, to, write to the ABC, write to a newspaper, write to me. There are lots of things that you can do. If you want change, don't sit back, don't rely on the Abbott government, don't rely on George Brandis, don't even rely on John Roskam and the IPA. Ask yourself what you can do to enhance freedom. Ask yourself what you can do to defend freedom. The worst possible thing that we can do is become complacent. Thank you.